You are listening to The Interactome, a podcast by a group of young researchers who want to connect you to the world of science by sharing their stories and perspectives. Just in case their bosses are listening, they want to remind you that the opinions expressed here are their own. They also want to remind you not to take anything they say as medical or professional advice, as they are not doctors. Not yet, anyway. Stay tuned about that. And, without further ado, welcome to the Interactome. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Interactome. It's Natalie, and I'm here with Maya and Sam, and a guest that we have today. On this episode, we're going to be talking about the flu. So we're really excited to go out with this episode, especially now, because we feel like this is especially timely as the holiday season, the colder weather. We know that the flu is generally associated with that. So we have a virologist on today. Erin, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Erin. Um, <laughs> and yes, I'm a virologist. I'm currently a PhD student and uh, I used to work with Sam. Um, before I worked with Sam, I got uh, my bachelor's of science from Michigan State in biochem and molecular biology. And I uh, previously worked in a research lab uh, studying influenza virus and a less commonly known virus uh, called reovirus. I feel kind of silly me going and saying, Erin, you want to introduce yourself? And then you're going, <laughs> hey, it's Erin. Yeah. You know, I kind of gave that away. But thank you so much for giving background. And also on this episode, I mentioned Sam and Maya, but I'll open the floor so they can say hello to our listeners. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sam. Uh, like Erin said, I, uh, well, I, I was a PhD student in the same lab as her. I actually, um, this is the first episode we've recorded since then, but I actually decided to leave a PhD program and uh, get a master's degree and go into industry. Just kind of change the direction I'm doing stuff. Maybe I'll talk about that later, but um, but Aaron and I were in the uh, same uh, PhD uh, lab, although I did not work with virus, and so um, it's a little bit of a story there, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, yeah, I'm currently a uh, job-searching scientist, I guess. <laughs> um, that's, um, so yeah, that's me. Hey everyone, I'm Maya. I'm a PhD student. I'm really excited to learn more about the flu today, so I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great. So I think we can kick it off. Um, Aaron, you already gave us a little bit of your educational background, but maybe if you could walk us a little bit through how you ended up in this career path. Where, when did you or where did you realize that you wanted to study viruses? Yeah, so I actually took like a bit of a different path than some people do getting um, into like uh, research and virology. So I grew up just like loving horses and I was horseback riding. Um, and I had a horse back when I was like in middle school and high school. And um, he ended up having a few injuries. And so I would always go to his vet appointments um, and spend a lot of time with the vets. Um, and so I originally went into college thinking that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then the marvelous people at Michigan State were like, you should at least try a semester of research to know whether you like it or not. And in doing that, I started to really fall in love with research. And so I had moved my path from being a veterinarian to maybe doing like, uh, like being a veterinarian and PhD. And then eventually I just moved into being a PhD, uh, like wanting to do that for my career. Um, because, you know, it's, Sometimes people don't realize, but like the research that we do, like for humans can have some big impact on animals as well. And so I kind of like justified my move that way. And that's how I'm now where I am. That's really cool. Uh, so working with uh, animals and stuff like that's still, I guess the part of the question there is like, why, why virology then? Because you're talking about like injuries with animals and things. So like, why in particular did you decide to focus on virology if you wanted to look at, like, this sort of, like, translating, like, human and 
of veterinary medicine. Yeah, so um, animals face different viruses, just like humans do. Um, And actually, like in the case of flu, which is what we're talking about today, um, so like all of our like pet animals, um, they all have individual like influenza vaccines, you know, like your dogs, your cats, horses, like they all have an individual flu vaccine that helps protect them. But even like beyond that, like animals are the natural reservoir for flu, like, uh, for flu, it's actually birds, which is why it's such a big deal, uh, for like our uh, like chicken populations and everything why you hear about like you know bird flus that are popping up because they could jump from birds to humans because we're working with them on a farm or like in the case of like pigs um pigs and humans actually share the same uh receptors at for like flu entry into cells and so that's why it's like in the case of you know like the 2008 2009 pandemic um, it was like swine flu because it originated from a pig moving to a human. So there really is a large impact um, for both like the human population and the animal population um, when it comes to virology. And it's kind of like why I liked that it kind of brought everything together uh, from like the two passions of my life. <laughs> so, and, and when you talk about this receptor, like, so um, I guess it's, probably a good idea to go into like maybe how viruses get into cells in general. So um, I actually think the one educational video we made as Interactome a couple of years ago now does talk about this, but I, I don't expect any listeners to have watched it. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, But like these receptors, like there's, how does that work? And like, are those receptors usually for something else on the surface of the cell? Like what exactly do you mean by that? So there's uh basically like the re if the receptor is how do i phrase this correctly i mean it's basically a protein um that is displayed on the surface of your cells um it does have other purposes or else it wouldn't be there um, necessarily but flu is able to take over or like utilize that natural pathway into the cell um to get itself there. And so basically what it'll do is there's a specific protein on the surface of flu. Um, and one part of the protein will recognize that receptor and it'll make interactions with it. And it'll basically tell the cell to bring it in. And so what the cell is going to do is it's going to engulf the entire um, virus particle. Uh, so it's, Basically, it's like putting it, putting it into a bubble because it's engulfing it with a membrane. And then from there, the other part of that same protein um, that helps bring it into the cell, there's a second part that will then uh, go through a number of like mechanical steps to then merge the two membranes uh, so that flu can eventually deposit its genetic material which genetic material a lot of people will know uh, because we now have like RNA viruses. And so flu is depositing its RNA into our cell. And then that's how it'll take kind of like take over the machinery in our cells to then reproduce itself to then spread throughout your body. Okay. Thanks. Um, so then uh, there's this receptor that the, the flu binds to, um, but like, is that unique to the flu? Um, cause you said like, you know, it's different with pigs and humans. So are, uh, you know, is this like one thing about the flu that's different from other viruses then? There are other viruses that, uh, recognize the same receptor, but really like how we differentiate these viruses are based more on the proteins that are in them. They're like the type of their genetic material. Um, and just other things like the fact that flu is surrounded by like a membrane. So every cell in our body has a membrane. And so flu also has one. This might sound uh, like kind of just a basic question. What is the flu? 
We hear so much about it. There's so much buzz every year. We're really encouraged to get, you know, people are encouraged to get vaccinated. Uh, We hear about different, you know, different rates each year. Oh, the flu is really bad this year. Oh, it's worse than it was last year. So maybe if you could just give us a rundown on what the flu actually is, um, that would be super helpful. Yeah. So the flu is its own, like, subset of viruses. So just like how animals are classified in different ways, like, uh, by, like, the different, you know, you have, like, the different kingdoms and then, like, all the way down to, like, the two names, like, how Homo sapiens kind of thing. So it's all separated, and that's why we have so many different types of viruses. Um, And so, like, how we classify flu is that it's what, it's, like, what I said before, it's, it's membrane, like, it's surrounded by a membrane, um, and one really unique thing about flu is it's something called pleomorphic, which basically just means it can take on like variable shapes. So you can have like really s- small, like spherical flu particles, or you can have these really long ones that we call filaments that can be like uh, like hundreds and hundreds of nanometers long. Um, and flu, you. That's like a very uncomfortable image <laughs> in my head. Just like a long. <laughs> spaghetti it really is of a flu (laughs) yeah uh there was a paper out of a lab that i that i like previously worked in where it uh discussed like the function of these filamentous viruses and there we had to take microscope images of like actual flu particles and it is very uncomfortable you're like oh my gosh these are (laughs) so long Uh, no that's so cool i didn't know that they could take on like different shapes but it kind of makes sense that they would because you said that they um like change a lot in our constantly i guess like um finding different ways to to get into us (laughs) yeah and what's cool is that um you know in more recent years we're starting to discover like why it takes on all these different shapes because you know things don't just do things for no reason they do it because like it's going to have a purpose. Um, And so one thing that we've actually found is by having those like really long viruses, it's able to better evade uh, like your body's immunity. So what it does is that it takes all those different shapes and therefore it can have a bunch of different ratios of the proteins, like the different proteins that it displays on its surface. And by having those different ratios, it's able to better like evade your immune system basically. Huh. So, like, the surface area ratio changes how it interacts with the immune system? The the, the ratio of the proteins, yeah. Because uh, oh, okay. flu is, like, the surface of flu is very densely packed with, uh, like, with surface displayed proteins. Um, so, like, basically, if you think about, um, I don't know, probably all of the images of, like, the SARS-CoV-2 that everybody has been displaying... Um, that's not as densely packed, so you'd actually see, like, the shape of the virus, and you can see, like, space in between the proteins. Flu's not like that. It's, like, it, you can't, like, it's just so, like, all proteins. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh. Yeah. And are these super long, um, uh, flus, are those the ones that make us sick? Or is there a different kind of flu that, like, are the super long spooky ones that you saw under a microscope, the ones that we get vaccinated against every year? So we we technically get vaccinated against all of them. So uh, the whole, yeah, so the whole point of it being pleomorphic is that the same flu strain is able to take on multiple different shapes. It's not a mixture of different strains. And so technically, like, uh, you know, probably the one that people know best is like H1N1. Um, and so like uh, that single strain can both be like spherical or those really long filaments and it's going to have that population. Um, like basically you'll have one that infects your, like one virus particle that infects your cell. And then when it goes to reproduce, it's going to remake that very variable shaped population. Erin, I have a question also. So are the flus that like people get, do they mostly or usually come from animals? Or are there like flu viruses that originate within the human population? No, so the natural reservoir of flu is actually birds. 
Um, and so all of the flu strains that we know of at least originated from birds and they've just passed to different animals. Um, why? Do we know why they, yeah. it's birds? You know, that I actually don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's kind of one of those things you put in your, like, your writing backgrounds of, like, oh, the natural reservoir is birds. Uh, but <laughs> like the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Basically, yeah. yeah. Like that, yeah. I'm sitting over here thinking, so, like, you hear, like, okay, so a chicken is, like, a dinosaur, really. I mean, the birds are, like, kind of dinosaurs. Or is this, like, a thing that like, evolved with dinosaurs and then mammals came out? And I was like, haha, we could finally have a revenge. <laughs> yeah, at least the flu evolution that I've, like, studied uh has not gone back farther than like the 1900s i mean i do just in like some research like you know we probably were experiencing flu much earlier than what's recorded but i mean it i think i believe it didn't even start getting recorded until 16th 17th like 1700s maybe 1800s when like people were actually going to a doctor and the doctors were writing down symptoms. So yeah. Before that it was the witches. <laughs> I think probably before that it was like, Oh, they caught the, uh, the, uh, evening, the, they, they caught the winter, the, uh, winter fever or whatever. It's like the blight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The so it had like some, some quaint name. And you're like, Oh, why is everyone dying of this way back when? Yeah. Um, I've never even heard of that. Uh, so speaking assume. of the flu being something that, you know, it's it's evolved with us, right? It's since the 16, 1700s when it was first recorded. And it seems to to me, and I believe everyone on this call and all our listeners, that, you know, it, it's almost like there's a new flu every year um, because you have to kind of, you get all those, you know, doctors, you see the signs in CVS. It's like, get your flu shot. Like, have you gotten your flu shot yet? Get it free here. And I think it's funny because I think of other vaccines that we get and it's kind of like a one and done situation. So what makes the flu so different than other viruses and illnesses that we get vaccinated against? Yeah. So really, uh, one of the main differences between flu and other viruses that we get vaccinated for, you know, like, uh, like measles is a great example uh, of one that we kind of just get one and done or one and then maybe a booster. Um, the difference between that is that flu really adapts very quickly, uh, to something that we call like environmental pressures. Uh, generally like if something that like in flu's environment, so basically our bodies, if something changes, that's making it harder for flu to survive it will change something about itself to adapt to that pressure and make it again, easier for it to infect. And can I ask mm-hmm. for an example of a, a selective pressure that would make that change? Yeah. A great example actually is the flu vaccine <laughs> because oh, yeah, full circle. Yeah. So <laughs> it's the flu vaccine because what you're doing is you're exposing your bodies to different flu strains And your body is then taking the time to fight this virus that's either like dead or it's weakened or they've like changed a little bit about it. So it's not going to make you severely ill, but your body can still see like the important parts of the virus so it can start making antibodies towards it so that when it actually does meet the flu, when, you know, it's really hard to just, I, I feel like it's really hard to not come in contact with somebody that's had the flu during flu season. But when your body comes in contact with that, it's able to mount a immune response so you don't get severely ill. Um, and so that would be a great example of like an environmental pressure because then it's your bo- the flu is not able to uh, like put on this wide scale infection of your body. It's getting stopped before it can really like get going. Um, but because flu is able to adapt so quickly, it means that we have to try and put those environmental pressures on it more frequently, which is why we get a flu shot every year, because even though we're coming into contact with 
you know, like the same strains of flu, those same strains are able to like mutate and then be able to maybe like uh, infect us easier. Kind of like how we've now had to have like COVID boosters uh, because like, as you like, we've seen multiple variants pop up. It's the same concept where like we have these new variants, it's infecting a lot more people. So let's make a booster to help uh, prevent severe illness. With with COVID though, we saw like new variants show up without new vaccines, right? So it wasn't just trying to escape the environmental pressure of the vaccine in the case of COVID. Is that so? Imagine that flu probably does the same thing, right? The flu vaccine is probably relatively recent, right? It's not, you know, the uh, you know the first few flu pandemics were not, you know, the same as the ones we see now. I don't think, and then. But there weren't vaccines making them change. It's just, you know, people, what, is it just people got infected and got natural immunity? Is it just changing on its own? Like, how does that work? Sorry. <laughs> I so, lost so like, the so, train so of like, thought we, with the question. We have flu vaccines now. So now that's a big selective pressure for the flu. You go out, you get vaccinated. The flu takes some time to evolve, to not be, to, to evolve like kind of around the vaccine. But there hasn't been a flu vaccine for a hundred years, has there? I mean, there was a big flu pandemic, like in like 1917, if I'm remembering, 1918, something like yeah. that, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, like that strain has not always been the strain of flu that people have been catching, right? It evolved from there without a vaccine. So that's not the only major selective pressure on it, right? Like there's, it's just doing other stuff too. Is some of it just random or... I mean, yeah, so most of it, at least in terms of affecting humans, it's getting selective pressures both from you know people who are getting the flu and are getting more natural immunity and also the vaccine. Um, the other thing that is uh, like similar to like how like with COVID, how we got boosters of like the same vaccine, just because flu is adapting. Um, to try and infect you better doesn't mean that it's changed like it's not making this grandiose change to itself either so it's still the basic like the same protein structure the same setup it's just trying to like make a smaller change to help itself uh like along easier so the antibodies that you're getting from natural immunity or from the vaccine um they can still recognize that flu strain, even if it's slightly changed. Your antibodies might just not work quite as well. Uh, and so that's like what it was with COVID is like, it's still effective, but it's not as effective as like the original uh, strain that it was based off of. But actually, because you said about the Spanish like pandemic, a very fun fact um actually today like most people are actually vaccinated against the strain that caused the spanish flu uh because they actually uh found one of like the mass burial sites of like spanish flu people like up in alaska so they had just been frozen for a long time and they actually extracted the flu like like the flu genetic material and everything from those people that were in that burial site and they actually included it in the flu vaccine to like That's so that people crazy. <laughs> yeah so, listeners i i wish you could see our faces <laughs> all of us all our jaws like, just stunned <laughs> like, yeah we're like you found some people where and you took what <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I think maybe this is a good well, <laughs> time to maybe talk about how vaccines are made because they weren't just like taking virus out of dead, you know, dead bodies and being like, yeah, we're just going to like hit it over the head a couple times to make sure it's dead and stick it into people's arms, right? There's there's a process for how this is made and how we, you know, make flu vaccines every year. So maybe it might be worth getting going into that now. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of ways that vaccines are made. Um, I mean, I know that 
right now they're working on flu vaccines that use the new like mRNA technology. I guess it's it's not very new, but it's new to the public. Um, but basically, uh, twice a year, the World Health Organization will gather a team of scientists from the northern and southern hemispheres, and they will discuss. Uh, well, basically, like when it's time to make like the Northern hemisphere, since we're in the Northern hemisphere, when it's time to start making that vaccine, they'll gather them and they'll kind of uh, talk to the people in the Southern hemisphere that have been monitoring like what flu strains have been really present. Um, and then people in the Northern hemisphere will take that information and will include those most problematic strains into the vaccine for that coming flu season. Um, in like in an attempt to try and uh, vaccinate people for like what's most likely going to be the problematic flu strains. It's not a perfect system, but that's how we do it right now. Um, yeah, I had a quick question about that. So, is the reason why scientists from the northern hemisphere look at like the southern hemisphere and then vice versa? Is that because of seasons? Or yeah, because their flu season is flipped yeah. from us. So, oh, okay. yeah, so, like, um, you know, so, like, their winters are summer, so they're dealing with flu at a different time of the year, primarily, so. I was going to say, it's like that phrase, it's five o'clock somewhere, it's flu season somewhere, mm-hmm. since it always is. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and I was, I was always curious about, like, why the wintry months are flu season. Is there something about, like, the cold or the humidity that makes us more susceptible to the flu? Yeah, so actually it's a really big myth that it's like the cold weather that spreads flu. The actual real reason why viruses spread more easily in the winter is because we are inside a lot more. And so like, you know how they're kind of, like with COVID, they're kind of like, well, like, you know, like be careful inside because it can spread. That's how it is. Like everybody's inside in the winter. And so you're just around everybody rather than outside. And so that's how it's actually spreading to you. So it's, it's not the cold it's, weather. <laughs> and I think um, what comes to mind for me is that we've had a couple sort of mild flu seasons um, while everyone's, you know, been inside. But I think the difference is that people were quarantining and people were keeping their circles really small. So as we kind of transition back to seeing more and more people, um, getting back to lack of a better word, normal life. I think that's when those circles kind of open up, and that's when the being inside can get a little dangerous. Mm-hmm. Not to mention during the pandemic, uh, keeping like really proper hygiene, with, like washing your hands and um, and like sanitizing surfaces, um, wearing, wearing a mask. If you're yeah, it, you know, if, yeah, like if your people are wearing a mask, like those are generally the best ways not only to prevent yourself from getting covid but really any respiratory virus that's spread through like droplets so yeah and i think another way that's super important for protecting your health um a a lot of healthcare professionals uh really preach the value of vaccines um but i feel I, i alluded to this a little earlier in the episode but there are some years where at least i've heard oh, the flu vaccine is really effective this year, or it's less effective, so you'll want to sanitize more and really kind of hone in on your personal hygiene um, as an extra precaution. Um, Why does it vary year to year? If we've had this technology for so long, why can't vaccines, these vaccines always be equally as effective? Yeah, and I, I think, like, the question of effectiveness partially goes back to like the way that it's designed where it is Mm. just like people I mean obviously they're making they have different like computational systems and making very educated guesses but in reality between the time that they actually have to start manufacturing a vaccine to the time that they're starting to actually give it to people flu could have changed you know um and that's that's just how it is because it is able to 
like change and adapt so quickly. Um, and so like years that we have very effective vaccines are generally the years that, you know, their guesses are correct. Um, but the years that our efficacy drops are generally like when we see two different things happen, we can see either like, uh, antigenic drift, which is where the flu will just undergo like a smaller change. Like it mutates like one of its proteins or something. Um, and so that, you know, like the immunity that's given to you from the vaccine can still be effective, but less effective. Like what I was talking about, um, earlier, or you can have antigenic shift, which is a much more abrupt change. And a really good example of antigenic shift happening in more recent years is the 2008 to 2009 H1N1 pandemic, because before that, uh, that pandemic hit, we were not seeing H1N1 strains, um, in our annual flu, like strains year to year. Uh, and that it, they, it hadn't been in our circulating strains for a long time. Um, but it had just then come back into circulating human strains. And so really no one alive had like that great of immunity towards it, which is why we then saw a pandemic. So is that, is that when we used the vaccine that was from the, so, so when did the, when did the vaccine from the original H1N1 that they pulled out of ice, like when did that come onto the scene then because if you're saying people didn't have that immunity and i believe that was after and so that was a different strain than the was it 2008 2009 one well so it was still technically an h1n1 strain it's just uh it was like it just has different like different uh like how do i say it? like basically you're looking at like almost 100 years between yeah. that so it's it's going to be different as it's like evolving, especially like when it falls out of circulation to when it then goes back to circulation. Yeah. So it is different, but I th I believe they just they did that after uh, the pandemic just to like make sure people were had some yeah. immunity to that strain. So I guess I got like three questions from that. Then first off, where did it go if it left and came back? Did it go back to birds, hang, hung out there for a while and came back? How, how did it, did it jump from birds to humans? And then did it jump from humans to birds and back to humans in the course of a hundred years? Like that's, and uh, yeah, like, like how did that, do you know how that happened if you're talking about like flu evolution? Because. So you know. I am not as well, like, so I specifically studied the other more commonly circulating strain, which is H3N2. Um, so I, I don't actually know like what happened in between there. My best guess would probably be that it did go back to animals for a while, especially since we saw it jump from a pig to a human. Uh, but in terms of like that long span of time, I can't really speak on. That's fair. Um, I guess it also uh, makes me wonder. Another question is like, so this old flu came back, so. Does that mean that if you get a flu shot a year when the flu is, uh, you know, the flu vaccine is not very good, it still could protect you from a future flu strain if that shows up? It could, yeah. It, and I mean, like I said, like the other commonly circulating, at least influenza A strain, because um, there are multiple different other types of influenza. There's A, B, C, and D, and the annual vaccine protects against uh two a strains and two b strains and the two a strains are the h1n1 and the h3n2 um h3n2 has been circulating since i believe 1968 um mm. and so that's why it is so important to like to get the animal flu vaccine because i mean really like as you get the vaccine every year like it can help you prevent severe infection too in the future like as your body has that memory bank for antibodies um especially too is like we have some evidence where like 
antibodies in individual people can also like evolve over time. Um, that's still like a newer area of research, but there are people studying like how our antibodies actually evolve specifically flu antibodies evolve over time. Um, and so that's, so yeah, like getting your vaccines year to year, like can help in future. Cool. And I guess then the question I have is like, why not, I guess one last question with regards to that is why don't they just stick the Southern hemisphere one in there too? just in case they guessed wrong because they already know how to make the Southern Hemisphere one. Just, I just had this thought. <laughs> like, you mean? Like, so like, I mean, that's of, generally so, what they do. That's generally well, so, what they do. So, like, they're not doing the same one every year because otherwise if they just did the Southern Hemisphere one for the Northern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere one for the Southern Hemisphere, it would never change, right? Just kind of handing it back and forth. But like, what if you had, you know, right now, I, I, mean, I got the flu shot a couple weeks ago but that was not the flu shot that someone in Australia would have gotten six months ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why not hedge and just compare the two of them? Is it just that difficult to make a flu vaccine? Uh, no. I mean, so... I mean, really what it is, is, you know, they assess at a certain point in uh, the flu season. And so if it if the strain is different, like they have models and simulations that allow them to more accurately predict as well, uh, what's going to be problematic. And like, so, I mean, there's, it's like, it's a pretty complicated system, but like, so yeah, it's not the exactly the same and they are assessing like, what are people actually getting infected with? And if it does differ than what the Southern hemisphere uh, was originally dealing with, like, they'll take that into account when they make the next vaccine. Um, so they are, like, they're not just, like, sticking the same one everywhere, but they are, like, assessing at least. Well, they're, they're doing the large assessment, like, twice a year, but, I mean, there are people keeping track of it throughout the entire year. Okay. Sam, one potential solution I have is that, one, you get the flu shot here, <laughs> in the u.s and then six months later you fly yeah. to australia and then get the other one yep. unless world, tour. To get <laughs> world tour and <laughs> so you're completely covered unless um it's bad to get multiple flu shots in a short period of time i mean uh i wouldn't recommend getting them like i don't know a couple <laughs> days apart but six months should be fine like in reality your body's you're just putting your body under some like stress for like two weeks, which is the amount of time it takes to like kind of mount that immune response. Um, but then after that, you should be good to go. There you go. World tour. There we go. If you're, if you're crazy like me and you want to get uh, a bunch of vaccines, uh, I'm, I'm definitely that kind of person. <laughs> I definitely have a, <laughs> I've, I've had to sometimes be talked out of a, a vaccine if it was like a weird experimental thing. Like, I don't know if you need this, I'm like, but I want it. I'm I'm, I'm very odd like that. I just want to see. Uh, listeners that, that, <laughs> that may not, that, that's probably not your experience, but uh, I, I'm I can like say that. that's not my experience. I've never <laughs> opted in for an experimental. <laughs> I, I also don't react very strongly to things. So like, like when I got like the COVID vaccine, I was like, this is fine. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not going to be like, sitting here like deriving an equation or something, but you know, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. And, like, like, you know, I just know like knock some people out and that, that, I mean, difference in immune response and all. Um, uh, yeah, me too. I didn't experience any like horrible side effects when I got the boosters and also my flu shot. So I could come do the experimental treatment with you, <laughs> <laughs> make some cash on the side. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so I, I think, you know, that kind of comes out of the question is if you're, if you're around people like uh, me and Maya who are like, like, oh yeah, I'll totally get that weird vaccine. Yep. You're, you're saying, so, so like, it's, it's probably not going to hurt me. Right. Like I, I should, I should be clarify here. Like this particular vaccine I was talking about was for like a very obscure virus. And I think it was just like different, different drugs, of course, have different side effects and everything. And this one was apparently a little bit not quite worth the risk reward. I think like maybe like four people catch this thing a year and it was not worth that. But you know, if you're, if you're around people like me and Maya who are willing to get a vaccine, like, I guess 
there's, of course, the discussion of things like herd immunity. So, like, you know, what, what's the point? You know, what, what's the point in getting a vaccine if you are afraid of needles or whatever? And, you know, you have, you're like, well, you know, other people could get that. Sam's going to get that vaccine. So, you know, you know, I don't, you might be thinking if Sam's going to get a vaccine, I don't have to worry. So, you know, how does that, how does herd immunity work, I guess, is that's the term you hear tossed around. And, you know, why should people get a vaccine uh, when other people are getting it too? Yeah, I think, yeah, the point of herd immunity, I think, is a lot of times lost when we're talking about flu vaccines, just because so many people are so desensitized to flu now. Um, But it is still really important because, similar to the discussion that's been around, like, the COVID vaccines and everything is, like, herd immunity, the reason that healthy people, you know, like myself and the general population who can get these vaccines and you know not have serious side effects um the main purpose of it is not only to protect ourselves but to basically protect other people who are unable to get the vaccines and there are populations of people who can't get vaccines sometimes due to like issues with immuno uh they're immunocompromised or uh like some like disease treatments uh, make them ineligible to get vaccines or like if they have severe allergies um, and they can't get it, the then the people, it's up to the people around them to receive the vaccines so that, you know, like say somebody who's vaccinated uh, comes into contact with somebody that has, you know, like the cert, like says has like the flu uh, our immune system will be better able to fight it off so that if we then come in contact with someone who can't, there's a much like less chance that that person's going to get infected. So like from, yeah. So from, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but from how I understand it too, it's like if you have a room full of say like a hundred people and one of them is, is not vaccinated and the rest of the room is. The flu is going to have a hard time jumping from each person because it's not dividing as much in each body because each body um, has the immune response like we talked about to fight it off. So it sort of, it not sort of, but it, it prevents the spread in a way. Am I thinking about that correctly? Yeah, so... um yeah, it expe- it suppresses like the wide scale spread that it can take gotcha. if people are not vaccinated. Because yeah, like basically by hopping from person to person, you know, like getting vaccinated doesn't ensure that you're not going to get sick or doesn't like it's never a one hundred percent guarantee. They're never a hundred percent effective. But basically if you're vaccinated and you like and you get uh like it's trying to divide in your body, it has a much harder uh, time doing it. And so that means that you have less chance of like spreading it to other people. But if you do happen to like spread it to other people, you're not going to get as sick. Those people don't get as sick. And then like, again, like as it has to hop through multiple rounds of like vaccinated people, it just, it's unable to like really make it to those people who can't get it. Yeah. So when you talk about like efficacy, I think I think something that like non scientists probably aren't super familiar with is like nothing in biology tends to work a hundred percent of the time. Uh, <laughs> like uh, we, as a we, researcher, we know that well. Oh yeah, Aaron and I have had many conversations in lab, being like, "Well, why this is, why isn't this working?" Sometimes just like, "Well, just try it again. See if it doesn't work okay. that time." And sometimes you change nothing and get a slightly different result because biology is just like that sometimes you know these systems are really complicated that's why um, error bars exist yeah <laughs> 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 yeah so yeah like we have a just yeah if you've never looked at like a graph of like scientific like especially biological data you have like these little bars on the other side of the data point be like yeah so this is a this is the range that we expect the data to be in um and you know that, that range exists because that's just how biology is um but, like, can we do better? 
than what we have now. Like, are there uh, people working on vaccines that are going to do better than the ones we have now? Are they, you know, maybe we don't have to get one every year or they're somehow more effective? Like, what's the future of this look like? Yeah, so there is uh, actually quite a bit of funding that's gone into trying to improve the flu vaccine. Um, I mean, currently available right now, there are ways, uh, and there are some vaccines available that have like higher doses or something like we definitely have a way right now of increasing like the dose that you get. Um, but in terms of like maybe decreasing the frequency that we have to get the vaccine, because I think everybody, at least everybody who has to schedule their own doctor's appointments understands the hassle of it becoming like October and being like, Oh crap. I have to find time to go get a vaccine. (laughs) Been there. Yeah. I know. I, I just did that this year (laughs) too. Um, So yeah, like there's been a lot of efforts to try and make like what they're calling a universal flu vaccine. Um, At least right now, I don't think, I don't believe that there's anything that's like really made it to as much human testing. They're trying a couple of different ways. Uh, And, you know, maybe at least for right now, it's not realistic to think that we're going to have like a one and done kind of vaccine like measles. Um, But, you know, maybe like reducing the frequency, like maybe every three years, every five years uh, could be uh, like within our grasp if we can figure out a way um, to like basically make something that can survive this uh, quick like evolution of flu. And it's like, how would that work? How can you make something that will survive that evolution? I mean, it, like, like what, what, and like, you know, why, um, why don't we have that already? Like what, what makes that so challenging? Well, I think one of the things is that, uh, you know, a lot of people like to, uh, live by the phrase, like, if it's not broken, don't fix it kind of thing. So I think <laughs> we've kind Definitely. of just, yeah, we've had this flu vaccine for a long time and, you know, like it's, it's worked decently well. And so I think, uh, for a while people were just like, yeah, sure. It's there. Um, but I think, you know, there's definitely been a push to better our public health. Um, and so, I mean, there's a couple of different methods that they're looking at. Like one of the methods that they're looking at is looking at, uh, trying to like isolate, uh, like highly conserved regions of flu proteins. So for people who don't know what conserved means, it just means like between different flu strains or between different evolutions of flu, that part of the protein doesn't change because it has an important uh, function for the flu. Uh, And so they're trying to look at potentially specifically targeting that. Another thing that they're trying to do is um, I might use a scary terminology here, but make basically like a super flu um, where they basically try to like align uh, all of these like sequences uh, because all proteins are made up of different, like of like the same 20 building blocks just put together differently. Um, And they're, like they were trying to just align all of the sequences from the common flu strains and make basically making like the perfect middle ground between them to try and like get like immunity for different strains all in one shebang. Um, but yeah, I th- I believe there's like a f- there's a few other, but those are the two that I personally feel most strongly will work. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> So, so I think when you say this, the super flu thing, like, is that like making a stronger strain of flu to like test things on? Or is it more, I mean, what you're describing sounds less like super flu and more like flu soup. <laughs> <laughs> I call it more super flu because it's combining a lot. Like it's basically trying to bring in all these different subtypes of flu uh, for one protein and making like, the middle point of all of them um but it it wouldn't actually it wouldn't like 
infect a million people or anything because in reality what they're doing uh they're doing this just on one particular protein so in flu uh there's the protein that's actually that i described earlier that helps flu enter your cell and is uh the responsible for like the primary like the beginnings of the infection of flu it's called hemagglutinin we typically call it ha uh so when we talk about flu strains when we say like h1n1 the h stands for hemagglutinin um and so your immune system primarily targets uh hemagglutinin and so that's what they're really focusing on for this like universal flu vaccine. So like if they're going to make the super flu, they're just going to make this giant middle point of a hemagglutinin, but we can still incorporate that into like more of the traditional ways that we make the flu vaccine. So it's still safe and it's not going to infect uh, a ton of people. Okay. That, well, you're also not talking about making flu. You're talking about making a vi- uh, vaccine, right? That's different, Right. You're not talking about making a virus. You're talking about making a vaccine. We're talking about the the super flu, or yeah, but basically that would be incorporated. So it would it would be more considered like a recombinant virus. Which I know that that term can sound scary because people don't fully understand what that means. All recombinant means is that uh, for flu, we're just swapping one of its proteins for something that we've kind of engineered to be better. It's not going like, it's not going to infect you more because not all of the flu's parts are functioning as like, as it efficiently needs to. So like, for example, you could still incorporate it. uh, You could still like incorporate it into like the flu uh, genetic material so that it's like expressed and like the flu can like it can like still take over your body and make it but uh the other parts of the flu in there are going to be weakened or it can still be like they can still make like a dead virus from it so maybe less super flu or flu soup and more just like store brand flu <laughs> it's like yep that's that's flu good enough uh and it kind of covers the basis for everything but it's it's not going to be all that much all yeah, that powerful you're, or anything. You're just making like a, a super protein that goes on like the store brand flu. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. probably a better way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, okay. That, that makes a little more sense then. Um, uh, so, uh, what, so when we talk about all this and like talk about the distant future of making these sorts of like wild flu vaccines, um, is there anything that you would like to share with uh, the listeners about the flu right now. So, you know, we're in the flu season. Like I said, I just got a flu shot. Uh, and, you know, it's there's things going around. People are once again coughing in the grocery store. <laughs> um, what, what do we, um, what do you like kind of predict for the near future? What do you know about for the near future for the flu? Yeah, so this year's predictions are already out because we are in the swings of flu season now. Um, And they are predicting that the flu season is going to be much worse this year compared to years past. Uh, One factor that's contributing to that is like kind of what Natalie was talking about earlier, that everybody's kind of been quarantined inside away from a lot of people. People have been wearing masks. So... Uh, you know, this is kind of the f- one of the first seasons that we're kind of like we're not done with this pandemic, but a lot of people uh, in the community have decided that they're done with it. And so, like, you know, things are opening back up and we're starting to hang out with a lot more people and we're not really like wearing masks or doing um, those kind of precautions anymore. And so it is going to spread a lot easier. Um, so. Uh, the precautions to try and like help against the flu this year uh, would be just like what we were doing with COVID. Uh, you know, like if you're comfortable and able to get vaccinated, it's it's highly recommended. Um, 
even though we've we've discussed some of the issues with the efficacy, like it is still worth it to get it um, because it can still help protect you against other strains that are circulating this year and potentially help you in the future. Um, definitely like practicing good hygiene of just washing your hands, sanitizing surfaces, um, or like if you feel sick, don't go into public if you can help it. So you help prevent the spread to other people. But if you have to, like maybe consider wearing a mask just to help not spread it to other people. Um, yeah. And so it, it probably will be worse. And so, yeah, like anything that we can do to help keep more people out of the emergency rooms, because especially emergency rooms and hospitals get really uh, full this time of year. Uh, so anything you can do to stay away from that is great for our public health system. We're making my plans for juggling flaming bowling pins. <laughs> <laughs> you should still do that. I think that's a good idea. That's where urgent care is for. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> nobody, nobody take that seriously. I, I, I um, I'm well, sure there's some people who know to do that, but not me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for giving all of that um, information to us and our listeners. I know I learned a lot, um, and this is definitely information that I'm going to take forth and and definitely share with everybody. I'm going to go to everyone in my life and be like, did you get vaccinated yet? Did you do it? Yet? No, I'm not going to be that <laughs> annoying, but I might be. Um, but I wanted to also thank everyone um, for listening. If you don't follow us on social, we are at the Interactome on Twitter. We are Interactome underscore media on Instagram. And Sam, what's our Mastodon? Because that's a new feature. Oh, yeah. We're... Yep. So I uh, we made a Mastodon account. It's at Interactome at Universodon.com. Uh, and there's an E in there in the middle. So it's universe, whole word, and then O-D-O-N. Um, so that, that got me a couple times, but, uh, yeah, if you happen to be on Mastodon, I know that we've gotten, I think a couple listeners from there now. Um, so, uh, yeah, feel free to follow us there. Um, if that's you, if you're listening and you're from Mastodon, shout out. <laughs> yeah, that, that was really um, cool to watch. Uh, when we made that account, people were actually like listening. It was cool to see in real time. And Erin, your Instagram is at Ninja Geographer. I think that's the best Instagram handle I've ever heard in my life. Um, so if you want to follow Erin, uh, you can find her on Instagram. Yeah, you, uh, I like to send people there. Uh, you know, I if you have any questions about flu, it's awesome. You can also come. Uh, my caption is, I believe, like, come for the food pics and stay for the wholesome cat content if you'd like to see shenanigans i get up to outside of the lab uh, or pictures of my cat i yes. love food and cats so <laughs> consider your you've got a new follower um okay well thanks everyone for listening and and uh we'll talk to you soon